Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's really neat to be here to, um, to help celebrate an event that is certainly going to get a lot of coverage in the next couple of weeks. Um, we sort of have these windows of opportunity in our, uh, in our media culture. Uh, every five or ten years when there's a big anniversary of the first Apollo landing, the, the window opens and we get a little bit of time to think back on the events of 40 years ago and the, and the other missions in the Apollo series. And I'm going to try and put Apollo in a perspective that is both uh, short term and quite long term. Before I do that, I want to mention that another reason that I'm excited to be here to talk to you about the moon tonight is that we are going back to the moon. And I'm not referring to the long range plan that NASA has of sending humans back to the moon. Uh, I'm talking about a mission that is already in progress. Just a, a few weeks ago, from the Air Force test range at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, a rocket took off with two spacecraft aboard. One of those spacecraft is called the, Lu the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it is now orbiting the moon. It's already sending back the most detailed pictures ever taken of the moon from orbit. It will continue to do so, and it will be so powerful, in fact, that when it flies over the Apollo landing sites, we will be able to see the equipment the astronauts left behind on the moon. So that's going to be exciting. The other spacecraft, the other half of the mission, is a little spacecraft, relatively little, called LCROSS, which is, uh, you know, NASA's got to have acronyms, so if you want to be really in line with NASA ease, it's LCROSS. I always used to say, it, you know, you've been at NASA too long when you come to an intersection and you read the sign and you say S-top. But um, <laughs> LCROSS stands for Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. What does that mean? Well, it's remaining attached for the time being to the upper stage of the rocket that launched it to the moon. And it's circling in a very, very big orbit. It's almost, it's, it's essentially the same diameter as the orbit of the moon. And it's kind of in a holding pattern while the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter surveys the moon. But on October 9th, LCROSS and the upper stage of the, the, the booster, the, it's called the Centaur booster stage, will come hurtling in at the south polar region of the moon. Shortly before they hit, they will separate. The booster will strike the moon first. It weighs about 2,200 pounds. It will strike, if all goes well, within a crater at the south pole of the moon that is permanently in shadow. So the possibility is, what we hope, is that there is ice buried on the floor of these craters that are always in shadow. Ice deposited over billions of years by comets that have struck the moon. That impact will create a plume of, of material that will rise six miles into that black lunar sky. The LCROSS spacecraft will be following a few minutes behind and will analyze that material before it impacts the moon and it will stream that data back to Earth. At the same time, telescopes here on Earth in places like the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii will be monitoring the event and analyzing the light reflected by that plume and try and determine, along with the data from the LCROSS spacecraft, whether in fact there is water ice in that plume. And so we are starting to explore the moon in a really spectacular way. So stay tuned. It's going to be scientifically important, and it's also going to be important for future exploration because it costs so much to carry supplies to the moon that if you could send astronauts there and have sources of water, which you could break down into hydrogen and oxygen nearby, it would be a tremendous boon to future exploration of the moon. So I wanted to give you that little uh, sort of coming attraction before we look back. So I want to look back to July 20th, 1969. It's indelible in my memory. That summer was the summer I turned 13. 
I had told my parents that there was no way I was going to summer camp. I don't know whether they were planning to send me, but it was not going to happen. About 40 years ago this time, I was starting to see the excitement level build. I, I was already a space junkie, as you might imagine. And I had been looking forward to this for as long as I had known it was going to happen. And to actually be waiting for it to really happen, to be able to turn on the TV and see TV ads for the upcoming coverage, to see, for example, TV Guide with a cover that advertised the very first live telecast from the surface of the moon, to see the Life magazine that showed the picture of Neil Armstrong waving to the crowd as he boarded the, the van to go to the launch pad on the morning of July 16th. This was something that hit me on a gut level, not just because I was such a space nut, but I felt that I was sharing this excitement with the whole country. This was a national event. And it's understandable that it should be that way because Apollo was a truly momentous endeavor. It was taking something that most people would have said was impossible 10 years earlier. They would have said it wasn't going to happen in their lifetimes. It was science fiction. And here we were, we were really going to do it. It was also critical from the standpoint of national prestige. President Kennedy in 1961 had challenged the nation to put a man on the moon and return him safely to the earth before the end of the 1960s. Why did he do that? It wasn't because he suddenly fell in love with exploration. It wasn't because the idea of going to the moon was somehow exciting to him on a scientific level or anything like that or even a technological level, although he certainly saw the the benefits of advancing technology. It was because he wanted to show the world the strength of a free society. He wanted to score a critical victory of world opinion in the midst of the Cold War, at the height of the Cold War. Apollo was an instrument of geopolitics. But I wasn't thinking about any of that. And when the astronauts lifted off, I was parked right in front of the old, uh, well, not so old, actually, a few years old, Heathkit color TV. Remember Heathkit? Anybody who's as old as I am or older? My dad had built a Heathkit color set a few years before, and so I watched the launch on that. And I had my, my usual setup, my own little mission control in the den with the maps of the moon, the Ravel model kits, of the spacecraft, I see a lot of heads nodding, and um, the copies of Time and Newsweek and TV Guide. Four days later, after I had sent my dad out to fill up the car with Gulf gasoline because Gulf was offering a paper replica of the lunar module, <laughs> I was once again parked in front of the Heath kit for history's first landing on another world. And I listened to Buzz Aldrin reading off those numbers of diminishing altitude and speed, not quite understanding what I was hearing. And then suddenly they were down. And then it was what seemed like a very long wait. It was actually less than seven hours until they got sealed up in their spacesuits. They um, vented the oxygen from the cabin of the lunar module. And Neil Armstrong emerged from that spacecraft and climbed down the ladder. It was a black and white transmission, so it was fine with me to be in front of the black and white zenith in my parents' bedroom when this came down. It was like a dream. It was magical. The images were ghostly. They were. They were uh, very stark. Uh, you could almost, it was almost hard to tell what you were looking at at times. It was like something from another reality, but it was happening. And I know that I sound like an aging baby boomer. 
I do. I know that. 